Welcome to the Barbarian Hour podcast, where we conquer the impossible. The Barbarian Hour podcast is presented by Barbarian Apparel. Here is Jared Opfer and Zeb Miller. Are you ready? Nice, Coach. Can you give us a quick rundown on home use mats, how we contact Kevin Roberts for camps, and how we can get a hold of Kevin Roberts for home use mats and personalized Resolite mats from Kevin Roberts. Yeah, so I, thank you for mentioning that. I love being a Resolite rep, man. I love it. Great company, best mats in the business. If you ask me, the gold standard. Um, so, Roberts Wrestling at Outlook.com is my email. Uh, RobertsWrestling.com is my website, which has all my contact info on there. Um, and they can follow me at Roberts Wrestling on Instagram. We sit down with Ian Miller, current coach at App State. He shares with us why he chose fishing over winning a world title, along with how Clint Musler saved his wrestling career. We also get into some Tate and Tom Miller stories, and then he sets the facts straight on his uh, famous bottle cap incident. Hope you guys enjoy. So tonight on the show on Barbarian Hour, we're going to have Ian Miller. Ian's a three-time All-American assistant coach at Appalachian State University in Boone, North Carolina. They had an All-American this year at 149 pounds, and Ian was assistant for four years at Oregon State, three-time All-American for Kent State, state champion for Oak Harbor High School. Ian, welcome to the show tonight. Thanks. I'm excited. Thanks for having me. What's going on, Ian? Good to uh, not much. have you on. Okay, so I'll start off. I'll start off. I'll kick it off. You guys had seven qualifiers this year at App, right? Yep. yep. Is that a school record? That is, yeah. Uh, so we qualified the first seven weights, 125 through 174. We qualified uh, for the NCAAs. So we did set a school record. Um, last year, they actually set the school record with six. So we beat it this year by one. So, I mean, it's just on a trending up. What up? Everybody's back. That's yep. what I was going to ask. Everyone's back. Are they taking Yeah, that? so uh, our, our 125, Cody Russell, and our 174, Thomas Flitz, they were seniors, but they're, we're bringing them back for their sixth year, their COVID year. And, and besides, I, besides that, you know, everyone else in the lineup is pretty young, like at least got two to three years left. How does that work, you know, coming in the first year, now you have recruits coming in and everyone coming back? You know, what, what's the message you're saying to these new guys coming in? I mean, I, I, I would, I'm not going to be surprised next year if we have some NCAA qualifiers that aren't even our starters. Um, that's how kind of deep and deep we're getting at those middle weights, those lower weights. Um, so I'm kind of excited. Everyone's kind of scrapping. And, you know, when you get in our room and you see our guys go live, like, you'll see John John getting taken down. You'll see, you know, it's just, there's no uh, definite guy at any weight. So it's, it's exciting. John John, who's John John? John John Milner. Uh, he's a 149 pounder. Uh, he took eight this year at NCAA Blaze. So he was, he beat Heil in the Southern Conference Finals. He, did he beat Heil in the duel as well? They didn't wrestle. Um, they didn't wrestle Heil. I think Heil might have been banged up or something during the duel. So we didn't. We didn't wrestle him. Um, I'm, I'm not sure who he wrestled for Campbell, but. Okay, so you guys actually had to. Then it was a situation where you were probably going to have to beat him in the round of twelve. Yeah. He actually gets beat by Fine Silver of Duke, and then you beat you. I mean, in a match that you controlled with Fine Silver. Right. Which you can never count the fine silvers out. They're really tough, yeah. but like, you know, that's a match where you guys looking forward to a potential round of 12 matchup with Heil. Yeah, no, I think, uh, you know, I think it was pretty crazy to have that kind of triangle of three NC like guys that are wrestling down at NC in North Carolina right now, kind of battling for an all American spot. And um, honestly, when you get in that blood round, that backside, it's, it's just all about guts and toughness at that point. And, you know, I know John, John, and that's all he's got really. He's, he's not, he doesn't have the greatest technique, but he's got a lot of heart and a lot of toughness. 
when you look at it, you know, you guys got such a, a, a tough, talented lineup. You got seven qualifiers, five conference champs. Was that a school record with the five conference champs as well? I think, uh, I think five tied the record. So it tied it. So you guys yeah. just had like an unreal season and it was this COVID season. What was your testing protocol for, for Appalachian state? Um, so as soon as kind of, we started, um, so we started official practices. I want to say November uh, or late October. Um, as soon as we started that, we were testing three times a week. Um, we, we test on Monday, Wednesday, Friday, and that was kind of the protocol, um, just for our conference. And then, um, if we wanted to wrestle out of conference, we kind of had to do whatever their conference rules were and regulations. So we wrestled NC state. Uh, out of conference. So we kind of had to do what the ACC's um, protocols were. But, uh, you know, I think wrestling is kind of one of those sports where, you know, we're really disciplined anyways, when it comes to weight cutting, all that kind of stuff. So it was not that hard um, for our guys to kind of transition into, uh, you know, a testing protocol at all. You mentioned uh, off air, right? You're working towards U23s right now. Who are some of the guys you're taking out there? You're looking yeah. To do big things. So um, we're taking um, Caleb Smith. He's a 57 kilo. Uh, he's, he was um, our backup uh, 125 pounder to Cody Russell this year. Uh, he, we were just up in Lock Haven. He went undefeated up there. He's just been wrestling tough. He's, he's a great kid. And we're taking him out there. We're taking Sean Carter. He was a, um, our 133 NCAA qualifier. Um, we're taking Anthony Burrito. He was a 141 qualifier. Um, I think we're going to take, uh, we're taking obviously John, John Milner. Um, and then Barrett Blakely, uh, he's on wrestle 86 kilograms. Um, he was, he, he wrestles 184 for us. And then we're going to take our heavyweight Mike Brochelle. So yeah, just kind of a handful of our guys that we're kind of seeing, um, you know, just been, you know, wrestling really tough and kind of dedicating themselves. And uh, we want to see them do good things out there. Is that up in Ohio again this year? No. Where is no. it? Nebraska. They, uh, <clears throat> well, just last week, they let us know it's going to be in Lincoln, Nebraska. So <laughs> <laughs> last minute. So, uh, yeah. No biggie. Yeah. We'll a few weeks to kind of get flights around and <sighs> plan this whole trip. You know, you can't really drive out to Lincoln. So uh, we had to look into getting flights. So, I mean, that's the re real reason we're not taking that many guys. We would love to take 20, you know, 20, 27 guys out then or up to U 23s. But uh, you know, if it was in Ohio, we'd just, you know, get two vans and drive up there and it's real doable, but you know, being out in Lincoln, we kind of have to uh, kind of watch what, what's, what's in the budget and uh, you know, take our best guys. I can't believe that they just like announced it. Cause we, you, you actually, I, you told me, I think what's going to be in Ohio and we never knew where it was going to be. And then, you know, I think for someone like you, you know, when it was in Akron, you could just go from Kent right from your house. It was 15 minutes from your bed, from your yeah. front doorstep. That's easy for a guy like you. Right. Oh, I loved it. It was, <laughs> it made life so easy. I said it, it couldn't have been any easier. You know, the only the easier it could be is if it was in Kent, you know, and actually where, where I lived, um, I think it was my last year. It was, it was closer for me to drive there than me to drive into Kent. Wow. It was Where'd cool. you live that last year? I lived out in Talmadge. So, uh, okay. yeah, yeah. Nice. So it was, it was, I loved, I loved being able to kind of just go and drive down the road and compete. Yeah, I mean, think about this, you know, you, you obviously know, you know, the real far end of the travel spectrum, right? Like Oregon yeah. State is the far furthest end of the travel spectrum in Division One college wrestling. You're the furth furthest Northwest team in the United States of America and NCAA Division One. And how much do you think you learned about travel being on staff at Oregon State? Oh, that was, uh, that was huge. Um, just, I mean, every week we were driving to Portland pretty much to get, hop on a flight. And, uh, you know, our, our easiest flight was probably flying to like a Las Vegas invitation or something like that. And, um, it was rough. Uh, you know, if we wanted to come out East, we'd have to leave probably, you know, at least two days before the competition to get, you know, acclimated to, you know, the time change and everything like that. Um, so it, 
you know, it definitely made you tough, uh, getting on those flights and, and everything. And, um, yeah, so it was, it was an experience. I don't, I don't miss, I don't miss flying as much. Uh, I really like kind of being able to take vans, buses and, and stuff like that. And maybe only flying once or twice, you know, so. That's, that's complete opposite of our careers. I, I mean, what did we fly to Reno? Is that about it? We flew to Reno. Northern and then Illinois. the first time I ever flew was to Northern Illinois. Right. And maybe drove this second and time. We, yeah. We drove everywhere else. Yeah. Like we, I, we flew twice at Kent state. Ian, did you guys fly? You flew to NCAAs we, and you flew, we flew to, to NCAAs. And um, when we go to Las Vegas, that was the only time we flew. Other than that, we were, we were uh, road warriors on, in buses. Wow. That is wow. So you guys couldn't, did you ever even bus it to like even Reno TOC so, from like Corvallis? So um, when, when Boise, my first year in 2016, Boise still had a team and we drove vans to Boise um, for a dual meet. And then um, after that, we did take vans down to um, Reno to the Reno tournament champions. Um, but that was really just uh, me and Taylor Meeks taking a bunch of our red shirts or backups. And it was a 10 hour drive. We'd, we'd drive down there uh, the day before, and then we'd weigh in the next day, wrestled all day. Then me and Taylor Meeks would hop in a van at seven o'clock at night and drive back to Corvallis 10 hours. Through the Sierra Nevada and the mountain, Sierra Nevada mountains. Now I yeah. want to tell you this, Ian. You probably went through the Donner Pass yeah. near Truckee, near Reno, right? Yeah. You know that's where the people got snowed in and ate one another, right? Uh, I had no idea about that, but that is, it did that is snow right every there. time we drove through that. Right there where you were, the Lincoln Highway, I believe it is now, where you guys took the pass through, that is where the Donner Party got snowed in, in uh, late October. Uh, and they, I think, I think like 89 went up and 45 came down. And when they found George Donner, his brain was bashed in and they took it out and someone had eaten it. It was yeah. his idea, Ian. That, so there, I, <laughs> there was none of that. So by that time, our guys were weighed in and uh, ah. you know, very full. But we dude, sure think about it. Think about the white knuckle driving you did. And, and it's no, funny. It, it was funny. bad. These guys in North Carolina think that those are big mountains, right? Oh, we're up on the yeah. mountain. Dude, go out west. It is a different deal. Those Cascades are no joke. Obviously, the Sierra Nevadas, the Rockies, dude, they're massive. And the crazy thing about the Cascades is, and you and I know this, the day that you and I climbed Mount St. Helens, we went from sea level in Portland to the base camp at like 2,000 feet, and we climbed over 6,000 feet to the peak of that. We were yeah. at sea level that morning. You guys, you can do that in North Carolina, but the highest mountain you're going to there is, I think, 5,500 feet. We yeah. went to like not a big one, 8,300 feet from sea level. We did it in an hour and a half, right? Yeah, I think um, probably the tallest one I know around here is grandfather. And me and Emily uh, and her and her parents kind of drove to the top of that uh, back in, I want to say October um, or something like that. So, and that's about uh, probably 30 minutes away from Boone. So, yeah, it, 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 I do like uh, like the area around here, but it, yeah, the mountains aren't, aren't as big, but the weather is kind of similar, you know, it rains sometimes. It's kind of similar. Speaking of maniacs and you know, the other mountains and craziness recently had Johnny Julius on. Yeah. And he said, uh, one guy he wished he would have saw Russell more freestyle was you. What, uh, what's that decision? Like, you know, when you just make that transition from competing to coaching, what's the thought yeah. process? I mean, at the time, my body, my body from college wrestling was really beat up. Uh, but I did, I looked into a couple of training areas, uh, after college. Um, but yeah, my body was just, it had been, you know, five years of just, you know, beat, you know, beatings and stuff like that. So and you didn't, I, you didn't cut a ton of weight either. Right. It was just, you just no, had aggressive I, style, right. That my, well, took I guess my freshman year I did, you know, cutting down to 49 was pretty tough for me. Um, but after that going 57 was pretty easy. Um, but yeah, it was just kind of just dings and stuff like that. And, uh, my thought process is I, I just want to kind of feel good once. And, uh, so then I got a call from Kevin Roberts and, and Jim Zaleski and 
I kind of, I was like, man, that, that was awesome. I went out there with my uncle Zeb and kind of seen the, the West coast and seen Corvallis. And I was like, yeah, sign me up. Let's do it. Um, but yeah, I mean, uh, yeah. Do I admit, do I wish I would have competed? Yes. Yeah, so parts of me, but, uh, I have bets with, with my guys, uh, like John, John at the beginning of the year says, if I all American, you got to wrestle in the U S open. So now he's kind of cashing in on that. So oh. one of these U S opens, I might have to hop in and get back in. He was like, he told me he wanted me to do it this last one. I said, John, John, I'm not, I'm going to do it right. I'm not going to just enter to enter it. Uh, I'm going to actually train for it. So what would you enter at 70, 74? What would you enter? I'm going to go, I'll go 74, 74 kilograms. Yeah. So speaking of 74 it. kilos, speaking of it, it keeps coming up in conversation with Jeff Farney and I, he's for uh, Tom's youth coach. And he said, Hey, do you remember when Ian bombed that guy twice? I'm like, Oh, you mean Tyler Caldwell? He's like, yeah, he bombed him twice. He's like, how did Ian do at the world? And I was like, Ian didn't go to the world. He went fishing. And uh, I, he's like, well, didn't he said like, Caldwell's a world champion, isn't he? I go, yeah, he went in Ian's place and won the world title. Is yep. there any regrets about that? Jeff Farney wanted to know, do you have any regrets about fishing that summer and not going to Russia and winning a world title? No, I, I mean, yeah, I mean, no, I don't. I don't really think about it. It was good for Caldwell to go and and win a world title for for the United States, and uh, not a, not really. If I want to win a world to title, him. I'll go to go. If I want to win a world title, I'll go train and go want to go win a world title. But I just I wanted to go fishing. I had I had a vac, I had a vacation already in the books, and uh, I took it. And I had you know I had not, it was not only vacate not only fishing, but I had also uh, had a bunch of camps lined up that summer um, that I really you know. I don't like kind of going when I, I commit to something, I, you know, I, I kind of want to fulfill it. And I didn't want to kind of snub a bunch of guys like, you know, that had me, had me signed up to do camps that summer. Um, but you know, I w I'm sure they would have understand, understood, but. Earlier this year, uh, Zeb had the chance to talk with coach Musser and he went in depth of kind of the relationship you two have or had um, and kind of how you went through and fell in love back with the sport. Right. I guess, tell us your side of that, that relationship and story. Yeah. I mean, Musser couldn't have got to Kent state at a better time. I think, um, really, you know, besides, besides Hill, um, there wasn't really anyone in the wrestling room kind of pushing me and, uh, kind of giving me really good goes, you know, I, I wrestled with Hill so much. I wrestled when Musser was there you know, it's between him and, and Hill, they were the guys that are kind of really driving me and pushing me. And, and uh, yeah, Muster was that guy that kind of got me over that hump and got me to that next level. Uh, he didn't mention that, you know, I think he might've torn his, torn a ACL or torn his, torn something in his knee at, I think the beginning of that year. And he wrestled me, he didn't get surgery all year and wrestled me on it, just toughed it out. And, and gave me good hard scraps that I needed. And I think that, you know, really contributed to get me over that hump. And um, he always used to put me uh, <laughs> when I would get dinged up or something, maybe I couldn't go. He put me through some of these bike workouts um, that I would wish upon nobody. Uh, they, they were brutal, um, and, but he would, it's not him just standing at the edge of the bike telling me what to do. He was on the bike doing them with me right next to me. And, uh, you know, it just made me kind of, you know, grow to a whole new respect for, for him and, and everything. And, you know, hit, what, hit, what him and Hill did for me, is was, was unbelievable and uh, really kind of took my wrestling to another level that I kind of never really knew I had. Do you think, you know, everyone always asks me about, uh, shouldn't he have been a big 10 guy? Shouldn't he have been a big 10 guy in your mind? Did you make the right choice for you as far as going to the level, whether it was Kent state, whether it was Eastern Michigan or, or uh, central Michigan or wherever you want Buffalo, somewhere in the mid American conference, Ohio, you, whatever. Do you feel like, or a Cleveland state, do you feel like that was the correct level for you? Yeah. Yeah. A hundred. I'd do it. If I had to do it again, I'd, I would 
you know, I'd pick, you know, a school like a Kent State or something like that, you know, I knew right away that I wasn't fit for, you know, a Big Ten program or something like that. It's just like, it's just not my style. Um, you know, I like that. I like being the guy that goes out against those guys and beats them. You know, I, that was kind of, I like do, I like doing that. It, you know, it gave me, you know, it kind of, kind of built who I was. And I, I just like being able to go out against Penn state guys, you know, bent against Iowa or whatever and, and, and wrestling them and beating them. And it, and if I had to do it again, I'd probably, you know, pick another school like a Kent state or even the app state, you know, it's, I wanted to kind of show that you don't have to go to Big Ten to be success, be successful, and, and everything like that. And uh, you know, I I think, and also like what people don't understand is Big Ten schedules aren't aren't easy, especially this la this past year where you would have to wrestle a try meet against you know, you could have a try meet against Ohio State, you could be a Purdue and have a try meet against Ohio State and Iowa, <laughs> wrestling back to back, and then that's just not. That doesn't sound very fun to me. You know, I'd rather, you know, wrestle a Buffalo or something like that and then go to, you know, Las Vegas and beat all those a Cornell or a Big Ten, Big Ten guy. You think that comes from coming from Oak Harbor and a smaller program? Yeah, I guess it's just kind of kind of how I was built, how I was raised. And you know, I when I got to Kent State, it's not like I was coming in like this they had hammers on their team. They had Bedley on, they had, they had hammers already. It was kind of a known program, but, um, you know, I remember my freshman year, we had a scrap with Ohio state in a dual meet. Um, so it's not like, you know, our, our, the wrestling level at Kent state was so much worse than anywhere else. It was, it was more so just kind of where you fit in the best. And I think at a smaller school, um, you know, I fit in pretty well there. What do you think the biggest thing was, you know, now that you look at it, you look back on how your mom and your dad raised you, right? What do you think the biggest thing was, like, as far as your mom and your dad? What did they do different than now you're seeing other parents doing or not doing? What's different about Ferd and Stacy? Why are they – why is how they raised you that, that made you successful at Kent State? Now you're successful as a coach. What's different about them? Well, you mean – it's probably the, the polar opposites – you got Ferd, that's a grizzly bear and was could be mean. And you got my mom, who's a saint. And, uh, you know, I kind of had, you know, when I needed a boot up my ass, I had my dad. When I needed someone there, you know, like at NCAAs, you know, my junior year, my mom was there for me. So it was kind of, you know, I kind of had the best of both worlds. Um, I had a guy, you know, that would ride me and and drive me really hard. and And even if, kind of, you know, his training probably wouldn't go very far nowadays. Uh, he'd probably get canceled pretty quick. <laughs> true. That's pretty <laughs> he would, true. He would get canceled pretty quick. Um, but, you know, I like that. And it kind of, you know, you know, the, the trainings he did, um, his FIRDS practices that, you know, kids from even outside of a carb or kids from, you know, everywhere, Clyde, they, they knew what Ferd's practices were. It was kind of like a weird, um, you get to school and I'd have, I'd be a freshman and all the seniors were coming up to me asking like, what are we doing tonight for Ferd's? Like they were terrified of him. Uh, but it, it was good. And I think, you know, like I said, I think I had best of both worlds. I had, you know, two, two parents that cared a lot, but they kind of had different perspectives and kind of treated me, you know, how I needed to be treated. In hindsight, Ferd has a super high IQ when it comes to wrestling. When you look at it, Ferd is really, really intelligent and observant, and he understands he understands the warfare, wrestling on the mat. He understands the scrambling. He understands position as good as anybody has ever known. He was obviously pretty high level himself, two-time state champ, multiple time, like it was Espor U23 All-American, then U20 All-American. So he has a really good understanding of it. In hindsight, he knows a lot about wrestling. Yeah. Oh, no. He's, you know, he's still calling me today, and, you know, he watches a bunch of duels. He'll watch App State duels. 
he'll watch if he if a Kent State duel is on, he'll catch a Kent State duel or or any Big Ten duel, and he'll call me and and even if I haven't seen the duel, he'll explain matches to me, and I'll know exactly kind of what the situation was because you know he just he he knows wrestling. Um, like you said, he's he's done it. Um, but he still thinks he can get me right now, and I, I just don't <laughs> think that's. I had oh, to school him in the murder, school a dude. couple summers ago. Oh, stop it. So I have to ask, so what's your favorite uh, Ferd or Tom or Zeb or, oh, let's throw Tate in there. What's your favorite Miller story? Chad, don't forget Chad. I don't forget Chad, but no one likes yeah. to pick on Chad. I don't have. I love Chad. Honestly, Chad doesn't have too many stories. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> I guess – did you catch the stories from Eric or excuse me, Scotty the other night? Yeah. Whatever, yeah, I did. I, week, watched, I should say. Yeah, I watched those. Those are funny. I think the funniest one that I've ever heard was actually with Zeb. And uh, it was it was when you were something happened over at the kingdom and, and you knock you knock oh, Tom down. What's the kingdom? Goes, oh, 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 oh. And he goes, Oh boy, I'm I'm all right. Yeah. <laughs> Do you want me? Do you, yes. would you like me to yes. tell this story? You tell the story. You tell it the best. Okay. So he had this little S10 truck that are always wheeling and dealing and buying like garbage vehicles from this guy named John Dooslick. Ian, did you ever go to John Dooslick's? Yes. Yeah. He had a dumb and dumber, he had a dumb and dumber uh, bowl haircut <laughs> and he was a Volkswagen mechanic. The guy was a genius. The guy's IQ was off the chart, but he bought and sell Audis, Porsches and um, Volkswagens. Right. So he worked on, a lot of vehicles that just mechanics don't work on, right? So Duzlax sold them a S10. Yeah, there you go, right? The guy who's working on the Volkswagens, right? The, the Audi guy. So Duzlax sold them this truck. I was driving around Oak Harbor. I was like 21 years old. And I I had it. At, do you remember a dude named Austin Short? It, he owns the Buckeye Pit Stop. Anyhow. Okay. Yeah, he's he's a real piece of work. He's a funny guy, actually. It died at Austin Shorts and we pushed it into his driveway and they gave me a ride home and I got another truck and trailer. I went back and I put, we pushed it on the truck and trailer and I strapped it down and I took it home. Well, he, it was actually the weekend Tate and Amber got married in Gatlinburg, Tennessee. They come home and he's berating me. He's underneath the hood of it. <laughs> and the, uh, <laughs> you clap it already. He's underneath the hood of it. And he's wire brushing the terminals of the battery because they were corroded. He's like, the battery's just corroded, you moron. You need to go back to school. And he's on F and he's dropping F bombs and you're stupid. You need to go back to school for another four years. You you know, F this, F that. So um, so like he does this for a couple minutes and finally I'm like, Dad, that's enough. Stop it. Don't you tell me what to do, punk out. I I made you. And he's like going on this rant about you're a slug and you're dumber than a bag full of hammers. And this and I go, okay, dad, that's enough. So I body locked him over his arms <laughs> and his hip popped. Oh, Zeb. And he buckled, he buckled and fell and I'm standing over him straddled. Right. So I'm standing over top of him. <laughs> and immediately I, I stood up to my dad. I was scared to death of my dad for my whole life. I stood up to him as a 21 year old man. I got him. And, um, I, you know, I just, I body locked him and I crunched him and his hip popped and I'm like, oh, and immediately it's like regret, right? I'm like, oh, I shouldn't have done that. <laughs> so I reached down and I'm like, dad, let me help you up. I'm sorry. I didn't mean it. He's like, oh, I'm fine. And I'm like, dad, I, I didn't mean it. He's like, oh, Shit, oh right? tr trust me. I'm fine. And, and he grabbed my one leg. He wrapped his arm around my foot. And I luckily had a pair of like these khaki like cargo pants on they were like army car they zip pants. off you unzipped them or no they i didn't have there wasn't those <laughs> these were like sweet levi ones anyhow he grabs my leg and he turns and he bites the meat of my calf no way and i'm like oh oh let go oh, oh and i'm screaming and he won't let go and my mom's yelling my mom's across the street because the way that's set up, Ian calls it the kingdom. It's my dad's. It's the, where he got hit by the truck by Tate. Okay. 
He's got their houses on the Oak Harbor side, all of his property and all of his iron and his Art. jewelry, as he calls it, and equipment and everything else is on the Genoa side. It's across Nissan Road. And I'm like, oh, oh, let go, let go. And I like start taking my thumb and I'm jamming it in his neck and I'm smacking <laughs> him. And then I, I couldn't punch him now. I couldn't punch him in the face. I'm smacking him in the face as hard as I can. I'm pulling his hair. I think I gouged his eyes a little bit. <laughs> and then finally, I just squatted on him as hard as I could. Like I just dropped into a catcher stance and his jaw clicked and he let go. <laughs> and my leg's bleeding and there's chew spit all over it. Dude, it, he, it, my leg, the leg was saturated with blood and chew spit. Yeah. And I'm like, what is wrong with you? Who bites their own kid? What is what is your problem? And he's like, I told you I was fine. And I, was, <laughs> I like went off on it for like five minutes and he just like he eventually just sat up and started laughing at me. He's like, I told you, boy, I was fine. You knew it was coming. You knew something that was coming, but you didn't know what, right? Dude, if I would have had shorts on, he'd have bit the meat of my cat. He'd have had a mouthful of, of calf muscle. Yeah. But that just goes back to kind of what Scotty was saying the other night, like how you know, his hip pop and he was just fine. Like he is the tough, one of the toughest guys there is. They don't make him anymore. No, no. no and it's crazy. hundred percent. Yeah. My Papa Ferd was really tough like that too. When he got hurt on the job site, I think he was like, they were ambulancing him away. And my Papa Ferd's like, yeah, it's part of the job. Get back to work. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, he like told my mom, he's like, this is part of the job, Sandy. This is what, this is what they do. This is what we do. <laughs> he told, he told me the first year he was an iron worker, he was sitting on a beam welding and he said, you know, you're bent over all day. And he's like, so he said he laid back. My dad said he, this is, he's, you know, he's 17, 18 years old. And he leaned back to lay back on the beam for five or 10 seconds to uh, stretch his back out. His dad grabbed the stinger of the welder and hit him with it right in the chest. And he's like, oh, why did you do that? And he's like, you don't ever lay down on the job, boy. <laughs> Dude, the stinger, that's, 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 that's what welds. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. He hit him with a hot stinger in the chest. <laughs> um, I so Ian, what do you, what do you like most about Boone? Uh, you know, I think it's probably, you know, the, you know, outside of how beautiful it is down here, but it's like just, just the atmosphere that the team, the, the staff here is just incredible. Um, not only the coaching staff, but our support staff is, is next to, is next to none. It's, you know, our, our trainer, um, our trainer and our, our lifting coach are, you know, our trainer was a wrestler in Pennsylvania from when he was a little kid all the way up. So he knows a lot about wrestling and, uh, and, you know, that's really been beneficial when, when you, you know, get a guy dinged up and you have a trainer that kind of knows the sport so well. And then our lifting coach, he wrestled, um, for a D three school out in Iowa. Um, so you don't have like a, a hockey coach or a football coach, you know, or a football player, um, you know, training your guys in the, in the lifting room, you have a wrestler that kind of knows the sport, knows what positions you get in, where you need to be strong. And then, um, you know, we have a dietitian, a nutritionist dietitian, uh, with only one in the conference that has one of those. And, you know, that's kind of, you know, stuff that you see at power five schools. Um, but we have it here and, and then our, uh, academic advisor, you know, she's incredible. You know, all of those guys, you know, when we have this past year, we've had to do zoom calls with all the recruits because we can't we can't have them on campus and usually our zoom calls start at 8 30 at night nine o'clock sometimes and all you know all of them are on our zoom calls with us with us coaches for the hour whatever um that we're on them so you know they're really dedicated you know they don't have to do that stuff but um they're dedicated to our athletes and and to making this program great could you have done this podcast five years ago could you have come and talked to us like this five years ago? I've yeah. noticed that your ability to speak has like, and, and conversate. You were a man, a few words, you were a grunter. You were a, you didn't, you were a man, a few words. Yeah. What changed? What happened in Oregon or what's happened down in North Carolina? 
what's happened to your ability to really talk to people, talk about a program, try and sell people on a vision, try and tell people your goals and trying to get them to the next level. What, why, why are you able to talk to people so much differently? Why are you a different person from five years ago? When you get the, you're a college coach. That's, that's, you know, you're not just uh, in the room training guys, uh, giving them technique and wrestling with them. You know, you're calling recruits. You're, you're on, you're talking to parents. You're talking to other high school coaches. Uh, so it's just something that kind of, could I have done this five years ago? And <laughs> probably not. Um, I probably couldn't have done like an interview five years ago. Luckily, uh, Kevin uh, Roberts and Jim didn't really interview me. They just called me and offered me the job. And, uh, but, you know, between being out in Oregon and, and having to kind of talk with recruits and, and talk with parents and stuff like that, it's really kind of helped me a lot. Um, and it really gave me a great foundation when, you know, this last summer I had to do a lot of, a lot of zoom interviews, uh, with, with a lot of different programs. And, you know, it kind of helped me a lot in that aspect too. Um, being able to kind of be interviewed and it's, it's not an easy thing and, you know, it's nervous, but, uh, yeah, I think, I think, you know, the sport of wrestling teaches you a lot more than just, you know, just moves. hundred percent. Now, so you, you're all grown up, right? Yeah. You have, uh, yeah, Wyatt there. coming to town. What, what do you say to Wyatt once, once he commits? Oh, I was pumped. Uh, I was on Wyatt. I think I was, I was talking to Wyatt even before I, I got the job here. I was like, yeah, I, I knew I, we were kind of debating kind of coming here and stuff. And, and I remember going to a Carver, we went and got lunch together. And I was like, man, if I get this job, like I want you here at App State, like I'm going to want you down there. And uh, yeah, getting him is, is huge. I, I can't wait to get him down here. I think he's going to be such a big part of this program and uh, you know, kind of come in and in a weight classes that we kind of need right now. Um, you know, we recruited this, this past, uh, this past year, we recruited a lot of upper weights, heavyweights, 97s, 84s. Um, so just getting that kind of uh, guy in the room that's, you know, I know he's a worker. I know his work ethic. Um, you know, he's tough. He's a miller. So, right. uh, yeah, I can't wait. And I know the staff is excited. I know our team's excited. Um, you know, it was funny. We were flying out to, we were flying out to NCAAs. Um, yeah, we were flying out to NCAAs. And we were getting off the plane in St. Louis. And it was right when I think he might have won the state title during during our flight. But our phones were. Did you, did were, you hear Zeb yelling during the yeah. final? <laughs> yeah, well, we get off the flight and I'm, I'm like getting my phone turned back on and, and looking at everything. And I watched the video and I'm like, he won it. He won state. And I told Bentley, Bentley was excited, pumped. Our guys are pumped. So it was, it was pretty awesome. That's awesome. Yeah. Um, I'm excited to see how, how he progresses. I obviously he's, he's still, he's a mutant. And then his, his hard work is just, you know, well, I unmatched. think that's the biggest thing. Like, um, obviously like he needs development. He needs, he needs more development. Um, but our program's so good at developing guys mm -hmm. and, and getting guys to where they need to be. And, and uh, I think that's going to be a huge part of it. It's just that development process when he comes as a freshman, um, kind of just learning the blueprint of blueprint of uh, App State wrestling is is kind of going to take him a long way. I, I remember uh, we're at a tournament before I believe he even had a varsity match, and uh, we're in the seed meeting with Coach Bergman. It was at the Bellevue invite, and um, George's like, "Yeah, he's the best guy in our room." We're like yeah, all the coaches look, I'm like, he's a freshman. He even stepped on the mat yet. And then, and George is like, yeah, he's the best guy. Put him, he needs to be on a line. Trust me, put him on a line. You don't want to put him in the open draw. And, um, you know, obviously I knew, you know, what, what he was capable of. If, if, yeah. especially if George is speaking to that. Right. And, right. Uh, and then here, here he was, you know, four years later, um, just a, a man among boys. Right. So. Right. right. That's been an awesome feeling for you. Um, being able to work with him every day. So, yeah, I'm excited. And, you know, I, I know Randall Diabe, he's a, he's kind of our big guy coach. He wrestled 197 here at app state. Um, I know he's excited to get him here and start working with him. Was there any surprise for you that what he did from 
Super 32, where I think he was three and two or four and two at 182. Was there any surprise the jump he made from Super 32 to the state tournament? I don't know, not really, because I wrestled with him over the summer at Burnett's camp. Uh, when I was kind of home, I, I wrestled with him, and I'm like, man, this guy, this guy's gonna is good. He's gonna win state this year. I knew it right when I wrestled him, and he was beating up guys at at Burnett's camp that he probably shouldn't have been beaten up, but he was. And, and I think what happened at, at super 32, obviously super 32 was pretty loaded this year because people were panicking. It was really the only big tournament. You weren't going to have iron man. I think people were, so it, that wasn't, it was probably one of the more tough years of super 32. And uh, I just don't think he had, you know, the training leading up to it. You know, he, what he didn't, I, 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 I texted him. I said, Hey, you need to be getting over to Burnett's. I knew Scotty was kind of having some practices, um, but that was before. I don't think O'Carver was really having anything at the time. And uh, so I think like maybe a week and a half before Super 32 or two weeks, he started going over to Scotty's kind of regularly. But if he would have been doing that, you know, four weeks or five weeks before, I think he would have went and been a completely different wrestler. But then, you know, talking to him and talking to, you know, Tate and, and stuff throughout the year, um, they just kept telling me how focused he was, how laser focused he was all year. Like, you know, nothing was getting in his way. And I knew as soon as I heard that, I was like, yeah, this guy's, this guy's on a, you know, vision quest. Do you know why he wasn't training at Burnett's the four or five weeks before the super 32? He, he had gotten surgery. He got his hand reconstructed again. Right. Yes. He bent so, and his hand was broken. Right. So I, um, that's why yeah, I met. I met with him because there was something with his hand where it was, it was kind of overlapping or something. They had to go in and re-break. Well, he broke the plate. He broke the plate and he bent and broke the plate. Right. So he, they had to re-break it. And then I think the only thing he was really doing was running. He was able to kind of get back running. And then, and then he was, then when he was able to get on the mat, when he was cleared and stuff, then he hopped over to Burnett's. But that's what I mean. Like he wasn't, I don't think he was in wrestling shape. You know, you right. can be in running shape and not be in wrestling shape. Yes, I know. I found that out tonight. I found that out tonight. I wrestled tonight with a 220 pound kid and it was, uh, I just don't come out of a stance, you know, and I cheat, you know, like just let him shoot and spin behind, but like, it's totally a different thing. Like you're saying, like grabbing a hold and someone struggling with them. It's the hardest thing you can do on the planet. Yeah. Everybody knows that as a combat sport person. Are you guys concerned at all with durability issues? You know, people are going to be going after his hand. And um, is there durability issues that you guys are concerned with, with Wyatt? No, I mean, no, we, why, if guys go after his hand, that's fine. We're, he'll, he'll learn to deal with it. I'm, I'm sure guys will. And, you know, it's just a sport a guy cuts his head open and gets it wrapped. What's it, what's, if you're a good wrestler, you're going after that wrap, you know, you're going to try and make it as hard as possible. So um, we're not worried about it. He's a tough kid. And, you know, like I said, we have a great, we have a great staff here and our, our trainer, our lifting coach, are going to make him as best as possible. And if that means, you know, we have to do something where he has to maybe wrap his hand or whatever, but no, nah, we're not worried about it. He, he's going to be just fine. Will you run against him in a foot race? I will not. Dude, will he's not. fast. He's I, really fast. That's, I'm trying to tell my guys, because we have this, um, so in preseason, I think we do it in camp too. We have this thing called the knob. Um, so it's two miles straight up and, and we run it in preseason. We'll run it uh, the very first day of preseason and we run it the very last day of preseason and we time it both. So you can see how much you've improved during preseason to kind of see how, how much in better shape you are. And I've been telling these guys, well, he came here, he, him and Tate um, and Amber like drove by one time and I took him up it and, and Wyatt said, I'm going to win. I'm going to win this race next year. And I was like, all right, like he won't want it to start. You, you won't, you don't understand. Like it's, you can't run up it by the end. You guys are, you're, you're basically just hiking up it. Cause you just can't run for two miles straight up. It's just not a lot of people would do it, but uh, he said he's going to win it. And um, I've been trying to tell my guys on the team, like he's going to beat you guys in races. And they're like, no, John, 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 John Milner's like, no, he won't. No, he won't. I said, all right, we'll see. Like John, John, 
he's a runner, but it's more he beats guys just because he doesn't want to – he's got too much heart and won't lose to them. But I think Wyatt has a lot of that too. So it's going to be fun seeing those guys compete against each other. Wyatt's 205 pounds. I know, exactly. John John. He's huge. John John might be 160 right now, 165. So, yeah, he has 50 pounds on, on him. He moves, dude. I went to a track meet. He moves, and he is like – like he's just so big and he's his quads are huge, dude. He's got big thighs. What's he run? What events? 400. Uh, they're putting on the four by two lately. And he's got him. It took, he took third in the SBC in the open four. Wow. No, no. Right? He took third in the prelims. The, uh, the final, I believe is tomorrow. So we'll see how he does in the final, but he's the, the relay. They're having a great year. The relay Owens on the relay too. Oh, so, cool. but Oh, Carver's got a pretty good boys team. They got a really good hurdler. Another Miller, no relation. Um, Isaiah Miller, he's really good. So they got, and then um, Bodie's class is really good too. The seventh grade, eighth grade classes at O'Carver are really good in track. O'Carver so, has been in track. They've been good in track since I've been in school, especially girls, uh, women's track. 13, 13 SBC titles in a row, someone told me. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, they're almost like they're probably better than they're, they're not they're a track school they're not a wrestling it's wild. football they're a track well, school. let's just you're getting nuts now relax <laughs> relax there's no there's no uh state hardware at the at the in the trophy you guys oh yeah i think you're four-time runner-up four-time runner-up Jer- uh ian what you guys runner up once when you were there once yeah i think yeah once once or twice i'm not sure no you were runner-up twice when you were there Cause your freshman year when you didn't wrestle in the, in the sectional right. districts, yeah. they were, you were runner up twice and then you were third as a senior. But I mean, in that division, in that era, runner up was your state title. Well, yeah, of course. Cause <laughs> Graham Graham's national champion caliber team yeah, runner ups the best you're going to do. I mean, they're scoring over 200 points in every tournament you're in with them. I think. Yeah. Yeah. That was when they were winning. Iron Man's everything. So they're a number one pound for pound team in the country. Yeah, no, yeah. They were national champs in that era. You're correct. In 08, your freshman year, they were the national champs. And 09, they were national champs too with David Taylor. Yeah. Ian, what is the so you took a loss as a senior in the state finals? Mm-hmm. Do you think it helped or did it help you or hurt you? Uh at the time it hurt. It hurt me at the time. But you know, that loss, um, honestly. What, what kids can't really get over is once you get to college, your high school career does not matter at all. <laughs> like it, it's, uh, it's, it really doesn't mean anything. Uh, I honestly never even think about that match anymore. And, you know, it was my fault. I, I should have never, they should have never been that close of a match. Uh, but yeah, I don't think that even, that never even phases me anymore. I don't think it hurt me at all. I don't, if anything, it helped me. Uh, just be a better, you know, train harder. And yeah, that hurt, that hurt at the time, but it didn't stay with me very long. Rear view mirror. I love it. Short memory. I love it. Uh, so, so you need the story of your red shirt year with the bottle cap. Okay. So I'm just going to get the bottle cap, uh, the whole bottle cap story out there. So no one's confused uh, about what happened. Uh, so my freshman year, um, I go well, home you had a guy at Oregon State, though, I thought you were just okay. straight oh, right. up beer bottles. Right. right? So, yes. So, um, the story is that I'm this, this wild, um, wild party animal that eats beer bottles and, and swallows caps, and the cap got stuck in my esophagus. Uh, that's not the true story of it. Uh, it. It actually is a lot lamer than that. But uh, so, uh, going back, to my freshman year, I go home for Christmas break. Um, I'm home for Christmas break. I go over to Connor Witt's house and we're sitting down in the living room uh, and we start drinking, drinking some beer and it's just us two. So, you know, me and Connor, we like to play games when we drink. So we make up this game where we both have a red solo cup and we're sitting about five feet apart. And we're, we're, if you make the beer bottle cap in the cup, you have to drink, drink what's ever in the cup. So we're doing this back and forth and I don't know how many, you know, we got a couple beers in. Well, he, he makes it in my cup one time. I think Keith Witt was there too, but he wasn't playing with us. And, uh, and he makes, Connor makes it in my cup and I just take my cup and I, 
and I was catching it in the beer bottle cap in my mouth and taking it out and throwing it. Well, this time it all just went down all at once. And, and, uh, I felt it. I knew it went in there. Um, but it was kind of too far down my throat to kind of get it back up. And I was like, I told Connor, I was like, man, like I have to swallow this. And so I just, I swallowed it. I thought it was good. I thought it was down in my belly. And I was like, well, whatever happens, happens now. And, uh, and then I forgot about it. I went to bed. I forgot about it. And uh, now fast forward to my sophomore year, I'm wrestling at the Cleveland state open. And that was, uh, is that right before Christmas or right after Christmas? Right before Christmas. So it's right before Christmas. I'm wrestling at the Cleveland State Open. Jed Moore, who was an All-American that year. Right. Yeah, I, I beat him, right? Yeah, you beat, beat him, him earlier in the day. I beat him and then, the and then Pelton from Notre Dame College, the Bellevue guy, right. beat you in the semifinals. Right. So then I have Jed Moore again um, in the, in the, in the Concies. Is that the and Open you wrestled in, Zeb? No, no, that wasn't I'd the same year. Year. I'd wrestled the year before. But so then uh, I'm wrestling and I remember I was, I might've, I was, I picked down and I stand up and Jed Moore, Matt returns me and, and he, Matt returns me hard. I hit hard and um, he ends up beating me in that match and something just, it jolted me. Something didn't feel right. You landed on his forearm. Right. Yeah. Like he almost gave me like a Heimlich. Like, and uh, so we go home. I was, like I said, I was living with Kilgore. Uh, we were roommates, but we were living at Zeb's house. We were renting, renting rooms at his house. And I'm going, yeah, I just go to sleep or we get back. It's late. Um, I go to sleep. I'm not feeling quite right, but I didn't, I didn't think anything of it. And um, I wake up in the middle of the night and I have, I thought I was having a heart attack. Um, I chest hurt. I had a sharp pain and I was like, I couldn't, all I could do is like scream. I, I, I was like making like a horrible screaming and I go to the bathroom and like I had to puke and uh, I'd like puke and just be like blood and black. And I didn't know what was going on. I thought I was dying. So, but I was stupid and, and I don't get anyone. I kind of just think like, I just go away on my own. Or so I go back to my room and I lay down and I'm like, laying in bed screaming and uh i'm just hurting so bad well kilgore hears me he wakes up and hears this and uh he uh he comes over and knocks on my door and he, he's like ian uh are you all right and he like opens the door and i'm like no dude and uh he's like oh he's like so he goes down and gets zeb well right when he does that like i puke everywhere on the, uh, in my room it's all black it was and, blood. Yeah, it was black blood. And he goes and gets Zeb. Zeb comes up. It's like, dude, we got to go to the hospital. So Zeb, it's like, what, two or three in the morning? It's No, five or six. Five or six. Because you guys okay. had practice the next day. Yeah, that's right. And I called Ferd on speakerphone. What yeah. did you do to my son? No. Oh, no. He's like, don't you take him to the emergency room. You take him to urgent care. We yeah. pulled into urgent care and luckily it was closed and we pulled into the Robinson Memorial yeah. hospital in Ravenna and there were no cars, literally no cars in the parking lot. Remember that Ian? Yeah. Yeah. And uh, I walk in and they <laughs> take it like, what's wrong with you? I was like, I don't know. Like my chest hurts. I, I feel like I'm having a heart attack and uh it was sharp pain it would like yeah. cut, it would like surge wouldn't it you were like yeah. oh well like every 10 seconds it feels like i'm getting st-. like it would but it would like throb right yeah yeah it was the sharpest pain in my chest and so um they get me back there they, they get x-rays on me and <laughs> they come out and uh and the doctor i think asked zeb like pulled you know, me was, out into the hallway was he partying last night <laughs> and zeb's like no he was at a rest he wrestled yesterday like he wasn't out partying. He was, he was home. And uh, he's like, well, he's got a beer bottle cap stuck in his esophagus. And, he holds uh, the slide up and he points to it with his pen. He's like, he's got a beer, he's got a beer bottle lodged in his esophagus. Yeah. Holy I'm like, oh, what do I got to do? And he's like, oh, there's nothing you can do. Yeah. <laughs> we have to yeah. transport him to Akron General and we have to get this out. He's going to have an emergency surgery. I'm like, what? Yeah. Yeah. So 
I think by then my mom was there. Um, no, your mom was on the phone with me. Did she meet us at, at Akron? She met you in Akron and they were yeah. like, yeah, because I would have had to follow the ambulance. I took all your clothes because they put you in a gown and I had to put all your clothes in like these plastic bags and they had to ride with you. Yeah. Yeah. It was crazy. That's nuts. So I remember so they transported him. Yeah. So I <laughs> then we got transported over to Akron and uh, next thing I know, they're pulling a, the beer bottle. They went down and they're able to pull it back out um and and yeah i think i have the beer bottle to this day i gave it to you in that that plastic cup it's all have it rusty jared yeah oh my rusty jared he won the university nationals with with that thing in his throat he was the mac freshman of the year mac champ (laughs) with that thing in his throat yeah so i wrestled with it all my my, the rest of my freshman year um when he spiked cam tasari on his head I yeah. believe he had that in his throat. Yeah. yeah How I, I wild like, is that? That's crazy. I know, Holy cow. Uh, so it was lodged in there. Didn't even know it. Could no. breathe fine. I mean, nothing. I mean, I, I didn't know any different. I thought right. I never even thought about it. So yeah, it was, it's been, it was stuck in my esophagus for um, just about a year. <laughs> Ian, you might be tough too. Yeah. It's, uh, <laughs> you might be Tom crazy. Miller caveman tough. Yeah. And then, uh, so <laughs> I think, uh, well, Keith was still on the team at the time and, and Keith heard about it and he told Connor and I get a call from Connor and Connor is like, man, he's like, I almost killed you. Like, I'm so sorry. Like I didn't, I'm like, dude, we didn't know. We were just having a good time. Like it's, it's no one's fault, but my own, like my own dumb fault. But so then. Yeah. Periano, I, I called Periano up because Periano was running the Midlands and I was like, hey man, we're gonna have to scratch Ian. Man, are you sure? I'm like, yeah, he's got a real high, he's got a, a real likely uh likelihood that uh he's gonna get pneumonia. Because that wasn't that what they told you you were gonna get pneumonia? Yeah. Well, and then after like three or four days, you know, it's not Christmas yet, and Midlands is right after that. And I was like, eh, we're gonna go. Yeah. I, and I hit Ian up, he's like, Yeah, I can go, let's go. Yeah, Hill went out. I think Small went with us. Yeah, I went. I coached you. You're, and you're in the corner, right, Zeb? I was in the corner <laughs> for Kilgore's. <laughs> I remember for Kilgore's Midlands title, and then Ian yeah. took f- f- yeah. sixth yeah. because Ian didn't show oh, up no. for fifth and sixth. Yeah, you're right. And I, Ian I made the quarterfinals, and he lost to Jesse Dong, and then Peppelman from Harvard, I think, stepped on the mat and then forfeited to you, and then you had what's his name. You beat somebody else, and then well, he lost. I wrestled to Taylor wrestled. Walsh. Yeah, Taylor yeah. Walsh, and I was like, Ian, don't engage him at all on the mat. He's- and Ian was taking him down, and it was they were the easy Ian. If I could have taken him down. Could you? Would you agree with that? He was an Indiana yeah. again, right? Yeah, yeah, Indiana. It was again. like that tricky, and then he threw me on my head. And then he pinned Ian. <laughs> he threw me on my head, pinned me. I've had. But he that was baiting him. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Ian was getting these like super clean takedowns, like the ooh ah, you know, flying Bondini, boot scoots, inside trips. And then the dude set the trap. He set mm-hmm. the trap. They got into a hip to hip scramble, and the guy just like stepped over him and pinned him. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, uh, that's so wild. That's, uh, that was kind of like the blueprint to beating me is, uh, kind of set the trap. Yeah. Set the trap, and I bit every time. It was, it was great. <laughs> I remember uh, Marino, uh, the Northern Colorado coach uh, at, at U23s when, or universities at the time. I was wrestling him, and I was, think I was like a point or two from Tech. Oh, Mar- uh, 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 Mike, Mike Marano. Yeah, and then he lateral drops me. Yeah, you were a point I, away from Tech and him, and he lateral dropped under. I go over under with him with two points that I need a takedown. I go over under. He lateral drops me and pins me. Mike yeah. Marano, I love it. Kinda I love like- it. I was so mad. <laughs> kind of like Tate in so the mad. finals, right? I love giving uh, crap about yeah. that. Hey, Ian, tell us, walk us through the real beauty situation. What you re- what you recall of it, and what what happened, and and the whole situation. Um. So, was that quarters? It was the twenty fifteen hundred fifty seven pound quarterfinals NCAA D one tournament. Ian Miller versus Brian, Brian Rebuto of Cornell. Ian Miller, Kent State. Brian Rebuto, Cornell. Yeah, so I remember wrestling. Uh, I remember going out there, and uh, I just start getting a bunch of takedowns. Um, I'm wrestling. I'm, I know I'm winning uh, pretty good, and then he starts kind of 
I, I like hit a wall and he starts kind of chipping away and getting back into the match. And then um, I remember it was getting close to the end. And I, I looked at the scoreboard. And I did it. I, I would do like the um, kind of run all the scenarios through my head. Like, you know, I, even if he takes me down, I, I know he has to cut me and I'll get my point and I'll still be up like a couple of points. And I still, I have writing time, I think. And uh, so then he gets a takedown where he doesn't cut me right away. We're on the edge. And then he does cut me and we get back to my feet and he takes me down again. I knew after he takes me down that, that second time, I said, I knew I should still be up one. I think there was like a couple seconds on the clock. And then time runs out and I look and it says our, our score is tied. And I'm just like, something's not right. Like, that's not right. Like, and then I was just like, man, did I, did I screw up the math in my head when I was, cause I could run like, you know, that's one thing like, I, I suck at math. I'm not great at math, but when it comes to kind of like knowing situations in wrestling, for some reason, I kind of can, I can run like all the scenarios through my head and what, what I need and um, where I'm at. It's kind of just, you know, something I have. And, and I was like, no, I, I was for sure. I had, I knew I was up one point when the match ended, but it showed it was tied. And um, I think we tried challenging or something. I think, um, but the ref told, told Jimmy and told Hill to sit down, like the, the score's right, the score's right. And I think that was before challenges. I don't think there was challenges at that time. No, you could do the flag. You could raise the flag. Yes. Yeah. And but they uh, never raised the flag. We never, what, for other, but I know our, I know Jimmy and Hill both went towards, towards the, the table. I do know that. And our, the ref and, I know who the ref, I know the ref pretty well. I see him at every tournament I go to. Uh, he goes, you know, sit down. The, the score's right. You know, get let's go back to the center. We got overtime. They go in overtime, and I don't know what happens. I, I he gets in a front headlock or situation. He gets a goal behind on me and wins or or something, and it just sucks. And and um, then I, I walk off the mat and. I was, I was tired. And I remember going back underneath Hill, Hill was with me. I go, we go back underneath. And the first thing I, I smell is, is like garlic, like a garlic bread. And for whatever reason, that smell triggers something. And I puked everywhere. And I was like, Hill, do you smell that? I was like garlic bread. And I like, it made me so sick. <laughs> and I had a pu- puke in and I remember and, walking over it, walking in and I'm like, what is going on? Yeah. And, and Josh Moore's like, they messed the score up. And I'm like, no, I think the score's right. He just no. lost. Yeah. Well, Josh was in Josh. So in, in St. Louis, you can get kind of real close to the mat. Well, Josh yeah. had came down, um, down. You kind of had to warm up off site. Right. Cause there's no room to warm up. Cause it's right. The yeah. Are so close. You have to warm up in the little tunnel space. All right. So Josh was right there. Um, and you know, Josh was like, the score's wrong, like screaming it. And you know, Jimmy and Hill heard it. And so they, they're questioning it. Well, you had like, you know, it was a Cornell kid. You had Kyle Dake, you know, saying, no, the score's right. The score's right. You know, it's, let's it's, wrestle. Let's wrestle. Let's get a wrestling. You know, Cornell guys aren't dumb. They know what the score is. Like they're going to Cornell. So, uh, um, but yeah, and then I, I knew something wasn't right. And then I, Hill's like, I was, you know, Hill dre- drove me back to, uh, we were staying at the Drury Inn, uh, where we actually stayed this year. Um, we were staying at the Drury Inn. It's kind of this old kind of classic, uh, hotel and, uh, Hill's driving me back and he said, Ian, you got screwed. You won that match. Um, you won, you had more points at the end. It should have never went to overtime. You got screwed. And I just said, and then kind of sunk in like, yeah, that, that seemed right. Cause I, I thought I was winning the match and uh, you know, Hill, I think, I think Hill was in the car with me and more uh, Josh might've been in the car. And, you know, um, those, both those guys felt horrible. Like they, they felt real bad. I could tell, um, you know, as, as bad as it felt for me, it probably it, it was worse for them. They felt bad. Uh, then we got up to my hotel room. My mom came, um, came over to the hotel room and Hill told us that, I think you were there, right? I came. Yeah, I came yeah. over. You were, you were there. And uh, um, Hill told, tells us that they're having a meeting, uh, the NCAA was meeting and they're going to, you know, kind of go over what, 
you know, what they're going to do moving forward. And, uh, you know, I just had a gut feeling, uh, that it wasn't going to happen. Nothing, you know, nothing's I'm going to wrestle back and, and, uh, I'm not going to kind of, they're not going to re-wrestle the match. They're not going to, um, they're not going to give, send me into the semis. It's just, you know, it's just not going to happen. And, uh, actually my phone, my phone, I looked at it and it was de- like, it was dead from all of the, all the free Ian Miller hashtags and, and all the tags I got on, on my phone, all the notifications killed my phone in like seconds. Um, so I didn't have a phone and I don't think I charged or anything the rest of the tournament or whatever. I just kind of went and wrestled and um, I got a call. My dad wasn't at NCAAs that year. Right. I remember um, that part of it. So my dad, I don't know what happened, but me and him might've gotten into like a fight or something before NCAAs. He's like, I'm not coming to NCAAs. And I said, all right, great. Don't come. And uh, so he watched it from home and it was probably a good thing. He didn't come him uh, and my dad. I was the, super glad neither one of them were there. Yeah. Uh, my dad would probably would have had a heart attack and, and Tom would have probably killed somebody. Uh, facts. Facts. So it was, it was probably a, a blessing that they both weren't there uh, because yeah, St. Louis wouldn't have been able to handle those two. Uh, and, uh, but like I said, at the beginning, like that's the difference between my mom being there and my dad, I had the saint there that was there to kind of, you know, help me get through it. And, you know, (laughs) Tom, uh, Tom's advice, I think was, uh, don't get on the podium, you know, don't wrestle anymore. Don't, don't wrestle lawyer up. And I had a lot of people like get lawyers, lawyer up. I'm like, I, you know, I don't, I can't afford a lawyer. Like J Rob, that was what J Rob told the Kent state coaches. J Rob's like, ah, you gotta get a lawyer saying, and you gotta get the injunction. It's not the tournament. So my question, yeah. right. It was ran on track wrestling. So what did anyone, what was the mistake? Did they just was, add up, uh, give us writing time point? Right. Is that, I had a writing that time. automatically dealt it. The track wrestling should have been automated. Right. Or what was that overrode? They overrode it. It was okay. on a paper. It was, it was Oh, it wasn't through track. It was on a paper because I know Willie Saylor has the the bout the bout uh, paper oh. a shirt made of it. Uh, oh, that he, he has wears, a onesie made of it for Ferdinand, I believe. That he wears at like every uh, NCAA. It's pretty cool, but uh, yeah. So that's what happened. And um, then the even bigger kick in the nuts, right? The semi match was forfeited, right? So yeah, then then uh, he he's to wrestle um, Dylan Ness in the semis and. You know, Dylan Ness had been bound and I think it was a shoulder, shoulder injury, kind of all tournament. And he, he gets into the semis and his shoulder kind of slips out. And so he defaults out of the tournament. Um, and so that guy gets, so he, I think they wrestled like first period, maybe not even. And then that guy goes in to wrestle uh, Daringer, I want to say. IMR. Was it? Yeah, that was IMR's freshman year. So he wrestled IMR in the finals and, and lost to him. But, uh, uh, yeah, it's, it sucked. And then uh, I just remember I wore a Kent State hood, like a Kent State sweatshirt. Uh, I kept my hood up because I just, I don't know why, but I was just like almost embarrassed to go into the arena. Like I didn't want to go into the arena. I didn't want people see in my face. Um, so I like, I kind of get into the arena. I keep my hood up and I, I warm up and then I keep my hood up all the way until I get out onto the mat and I'm wrestling an Oregon State kid. Um, or no, yeah, Blood Round, Oregon State. It, yes, it was I, Elder. Yeah, I wrestled Alex Elder, Blood Round, at Oregon State, and uh, Seb said, "Don't go on the mat with this guy and uh, <laughs> uh, pick. No, don't go down on this guy. Stay on your feet and just blow through this guy." And that's why I get. I, that's why I did. Like I took him down, and he kind of he was kind of funky and wanted to roll around, so I just kicked him, went on my feet. I think I tacked him in the second period. Um, and then after that, yeah, Zaleski wasn't a fan of you telling him that, telling me that he was like, I, I knew Zeb was, I knew Zeb was a spy. I knew he was going to tell. tell him <laughs> that. Well, it's crazy because I went to Hawaii with him that year and I watched him a lot, actually. Yeah. Him and Ness had a barn burner in Hawaii. They had a one point match in well, Hawaii. Just, yeah. They got such a similar style. It's yeah. And he, funky. but he likes that, like that switch toe hook. Mm-hmm. And then he also likes the tilt. You know, and, and I was just like all the stuff. And I told you, I go, hey, 
I literally, you literally followed the game plan. I, you couldn't have followed it any better had you pinned him, actually, if the only way you could have followed it better. Right. But I was like, yeah, he's going to try and engage you in these, like, switches, and he's also going to try and engage you in some type of tilt. Yeah. Make him choose top to beat you. He's not going to even get the chance. And I you think, went on, you, yeah, you, you didn't, beat you didn't him get, bad. Yeah, I think we I think the, got the tech in a second, so it wasn't even his choice. So, But, yeah, yeah that was uh, kind of the whole ordeal. Um, I kind of just – used that as a uh, um, learning experience and kind of moved on. You know, people are just like, how do you move on from something like that? And I was like, you know, it's wrestling, you know, just step on the mat and just go. You're not always going to get the right calls and, and stuff like that. So. I mean, it probably helps you from your coaching angle now, right? I mean, if you're coaching a kid and I mean, you're going to have instances, I mean, yeah, if there's any silver lining, right? Yeah. I mean, it, it's taught me a lot. Um, well, it's taught me always to have a, uh, a challenge left. Uh, <laughs> so I always like to make sure I have a challenge in my back pocket. Uh, but it, it also um, really, you know, I, I read like the, the I, I know the NCAA re- rules really well um, when it comes to kind of like, you know, what, what you can do, you know, everything. I, I kind of read the NCAA rule book and uh, I want to know, I want to kind of know it, uh, I don't want any of my guys ever have to have anything like that happen. And if, if I can, you know, know uh, ahead of time, you know, and, you know, save one of my guys from going through something like that, uh, you know, I'm gonna, I'm gonna do it. So uh, yeah, like you said, it's kind of helped me in my coaching uh, a lot. And do you think you're more passionate about coaching than you were about competing? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I, I really, I, I love coaching. Um, you know, it's, you know, whether I'm coaching college or, you know, coaching at camp and you know, little kids, I just like, um, you know, watching guys succeed and, and uh, you know, just watching guys reach goals that they, I don't know if they even thought they could reach. Um, it's just really cool. And, um, you know, just being able to go in, in, in every day and, and do practice and, and work out with guys and, uh, you know, kind of, you know, just give, give the knowledge that I know about the sport and uh, see a guy, you know, progressively get better is this really rewarding. And, you know, I love that aspect of it. Um, it's really cool. And it's, it's like, I think I get a lot of that from like um, Matt Hill um, when I was kind of growing up or going through college, just seeing how much stuff he did for us. And, uh, you know, you know, when I, when I was in college, he, you know, he was uh he was still living in Pennsylvania. He he lived in Pennsylvania. What, what was his drive? Hour and a, hour and a half, maybe. Hour and a, eighty-seven miles one way. Yeah. So some nights he would stay the night at Zeb's house. Like, dude, that's just dedication. I couldn't, you know, that, that kind of dedication. Um, you know, you know, I respect a lot, and I kind of want to, you know, mold and kind of be like that. So. Matt Hill's awesome. I love Matt Hill. He's the man. Matt He's totally man. the man. Love him. I love the vision there at Edinburgh. And, and as long as they stay financially sound, I think he, he's going to be good. Hey, Jared, the last thing I have for this guy is I want to talk soccer. Soccer. Okay. I want to talk soccer and I want to talk running. Mm-hmm. When he was a little kid, him and I would go run down this like country road where there's no houses. Yeah. And well, you were training me to beat Eric. Yes. <laughs> You you wanted me to beat Eric at because Eric we did like runs at Burnett's camp, so you were you were training me to beat him, and uh, you didn't listen though. Well, here's the thing: it all goes back to you know taking the trap. Like I'm a sucker for taking the trap, and you trained me. I you I had the blueprint in front of me, and I and then I just seen the prize and I wanted it. So how you were training me is you were training me to use like stay behind him and have i ever steered you wrong no but hey ian go up to 145 you're gonna win state this year okay yeah. tax falls the guy stay fun hey ian make sure you stay away from like the switch with alex elder and uh don't let him get you in the tilts don't go down make him choose stuff okay that worked out okay go ahead with the eric burnett go ahead so you come to me and you're like i think you can beat eric in this run no one's no one beats eric at camp like you can beat him and this is how you're gonna do it um, so we we're, we go out running. You're like, you stay behind me and I'll tell you when, when to turn it on. It was like right at the end. 
I think it was like what 200 yards last yeah two 300 yards because you would have done it yeah and uh so I'm like all right so we do this we're training Um, I'm kind of staying behind you using the wind using you as my block the wind block and he's like this how you're going to beat him you're going to use Eric as a wind block and then when there's 200 to 300 yards left you're going to pass him and he's going to try and run with you and you're going to blow him out of the water and so I was like all right so I get to camp and we go on the run and I'm doing it for a little bit and he's just running like too slow. And I, it's just like, it's bothering me. And so I'm just like, I can beat him now. And so I, there's like probably a half mile left and I'm just like, I'm gone. And it was back by like, there's farms, there's like a big white barn. And so I pass him and I get to the turnaround spot and I'm on my way back and I'm like, I'm crushing, I'm killing like, I see where he is. I'm like, he's not even to the turnaround spot. Like I got this. So I'm running <laughs> and I can see the, the old LaGrange barn and uh, I see it. And then I look back and Eric's coming and I'm like, Oh no. And I'm, I'm trying, but my legs just wouldn't go any faster. And he's just gaining, gaining, gaining. And then he passes me like, right. Like he, there's probably, there's probably a hundred yards left. He passes me and just beats me and, and Zeb's there. Zeb's. What Zeb's are you doing? Him. Yeah. <laughs> and he knew, he knew right then that I didn't follow the blueprint at all. And I just, yep. So I don't think I gave you too much on that one though. I think I like let it go. I mean, I was. Uh, yeah. I, I, if I would have stuck to it, I would have won. I would have. You would have crushed him. I know. It wouldn't have been close. You'd have humiliated him and he would have been so mad, dude. Let's yeah. run again. Hey, we're going again tomorrow, Ian. <laughs> He'd have changed the whole like uh structure of the camp. Oh, <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay. My last thing, and then we're on the barbarian two hour, right? We're on double overtime now. Yeah. Uh double overtime here, Ian. Why did you play soccer and how did it go for you? So I I mean I played soccer since I was I was a little uh I got in soccer when I was a little boy, um, when I was going to Greytown, I was on a Greytown soccer team and I, I don't know. I just like, Oh, well, actually my sister played soccer first and I'd always have to go watch her games. And I didn't, I wasn't in soccer yet. And then my mom signed me up for soccer and I kind of just liked the sport of it. And then I kind of, um, I think I played until junior high, uh, till sixth grade, I played soccer. Um, and we were kind of on the same the same group of kids. It wasn't like any of the wrestling, any of my wrestling buddies, they weren't on the team. It was like so, these soccer kids that, that played and I was really close with all of them. And we were pretty, we were pretty good for, uh, for being young. And uh, so I got to sixth grade and I was around Connor. We were in junior high. I was with Connor, Jake, all those guys, and they're playing football. So I was like, I'm going to play football. So I go and play football for a couple of years and then I get into high school and, uh, and I didn't like, I wasn't playing. I was too small to play. I was a one nineteen pounder. I wasn't playing football in high school. Um, and Connor and those guys didn't play either at the start of high school. And so um, I think I, I was talking to some guys and there's our the soccer team was actually pretty good at Oak Harbor. Um, we had like Phil Wyrick was on the team. He was, you know, pretty good. And, so I joined the team and uh, I think I was like, a, I think I was JV. I don't think I was even a starter at first. And so I was JV and I was playing, playing soccer as JV. And then all of a sudden I kind of got moved up to varsity and um, Drew Stone uh, played soccer with me. And that was really the only other wrestler um, that I can think of that played soccer. And, you know, kind of just liked it. It was kind of just a way, you know, a couple months that we didn't have to think about wrestling and we just, and our team was team was good and and like uh, the, would you guys make the district final? Yeah, in the so, district. Yeah, we made the district. We lost in the district finals. It was out at Lake High School. Okay, um, so you went out as a senior because you were at a party where somebody was drinking. No, I went out as a sophomore. I played, but uh, but you went out as a senior. You weren't going to go out as a senior. Oh yeah yeah yeah. No, no why no. did you go out as a senior? And what happened? Why, why did you go out and, so <laughs> and how did the season go? So when I was a seat, I it was a South, I was a sophomore. Cause that was when we went out to Oregon. Yes. Well, and then the football team, the football coach is like, yeah, you're never going to play. 
Yeah. So you're never going to play. Think, I was really considering playing football. Um, because the football coach always wanted me to, wanted me to. And so I was like, all right, I'll play football. And that, but I was like, I'm going out to, out to the West Coast. My uncle and we're going to kind of see some, see some colleges and wrestle. And he's like, no, you got to be here for whatever summer football camp or whatever it was. I'm like, I'm going to miss that week. I think it was like a week of, I was a miss of lifting and football. And he's like, you, no. And I was like, all right, I'm not going to play. I'll, I'll play soccer. <laughs> So uh, I played. We pl- I played soccer instead. What was the year that you went out because you didn't want to have to sit for the Ironman? So that was my sophomore year. That, that was your sophomore, sophomore year. year. Yeah. So, dude, um, didn't you lead the team in goals as a senior? No. Yeah, as a maybe as a senior, but I know as a sophomore, I was like, like Phil Wyrick was one of the top kids in the state with goals, and I was maybe like third or fourth in the state with goals. Wow. And you just kind of went out. Yeah, I just kind of showed up. He was up. first team all state. The beautiful thing is yeah, you were the best guy on the team as a senior and he wasn't all league. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, never got all league or anything. I went to a game. He threw a soccer ball 50 yards from a flip. Yep. Oh, that's awesome. I do like that cartwheel. <laughs> well, I seen I think I seen a video of someone do it and I was just like, yeah, I want to try this. So I tried it and it worked. Dude, you threw it really far. I couldn't believe it. Yeah, I could throw it from the sideline almost into the goal. <laughs> Jesus. Yeah. I love it. It's the greatest thing I ever. Did it like and hey, in the game, didn't even try it before that, right? Just said, let's yeah. try here, right? Yeah. He went to a game and he got a breakaway and he 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 broke like three dudes' ankles and he just like scored a goal. I went, to, I videoed one of your games and I was like, oh my god, dude, yeah. you were really good at soccer. Like really, kind of, I couldn't. I mean, believe. it helped with your foot. It helped with footwork, and then you know, I kind of like the fact that you could break guy, like kind of make guys look silly. Uh, I like that aspect of you know, even when in when I'm wrestling, I kind of like you know, I hit a boot scoot so smooth, and this makes a guy look silly. Uh, I really like that, and that's kind of I like that in in soccer too. Like you hit such a nice move on a guy in soccer, uh, you can make him fall down or something like that. Kind of like the same, like a basketball player kind of breaking a guy's ankle, like yeah, stuff like that. I really like, I don't know. I, You're I good like at it. Kind of stuff. You're good yeah. at it. Yeah. So I love it. I love it. Okay. Jared, you got anything else for him? No, thanks, man. I, I appreciate yeah. your time, man. It's fun. Can you hit us with the promotion me. code real quick, Jared? Yeah. That's uh barbarianapparel.com slash BA, BA hour. And that's a singlet deal. I think it's, uh, I think $40 for 10 and you order more than 10. I think it's 35. I off the top of my head don't have it, but uh singlet deals, people are ordering right now for next year, trying to get them those orders in before, uh, you know, next season and get the, get the gear uh, squared away. So. Yeah, definitely. I think I'm actually, uh, we're looking into getting some RTC singlets through, through uh, BA. Yeah. Awesome. Perfect. Oh, yeah. Check that link out, man. That's the check that link out. Yes, link. sir. Yes, sir. Uh, what uh, Uncle Zeb hook you up with any BA gear that you like? Any any? Oh yeah, I got I got uh, I just wore the that BA um, American flag that I got at Burnett's camp over the summer. I was Did I give that to you? Yeah. Oh yeah. oh yeah, that's a sweet long sleeve. You can in the it's big A. That's American. Yeah. Flag. that's a cool shirt actually. It's like a it's like that old school material where it's like kind of a heavier, thicker. Yes. That's a really cool shirt, actually. Yeah, I did hook you up. Hey, we got to get you some uh, Go Ohio swag. We got to get you some stickers and uh, some Barbarian I got, Hour. I got one of the OG Go Ohio t-shirts still. Do you? Like, mm-hmm. let me see you wore that when we were chasing waterfalls. At, uh, I, I still have that. I just wore that the other day, and it still fits me somehow. That's awesome. It's like one of those you have, shirts. What do you that, weigh? What do you weigh? Like, oh, 170 well, pounds? What do you I weigh? I weigh 175. Run, Wait, 175 usually. yeah so after a workout i'll probably be 170 i'm 255 yeah i mean still running right zim you run. yeah i ran yesterday guys, and then i wrestled today i wrestled like out. 20 minutes today like a moron Jeez. like these sometimes i'll have guys i'll have to go three times in one day because these guys just like hey will you go with me and i i don't know why it is i just can't tell <laughs> anyone no. no i can't say no how's your body okay it's good good great. yeah he's still young zim come on yeah it's true ian what are you 29 29 yeah it'd be so. 30 Jan- january ian's a new year's D- uh, new year's day baby january 1st yeah I, I hit 30 so 
I'm gonna try to get all three zeros coming hey, in. Troy you know, better, next. You know, Cheeks better is, shape than me is John Mark. John Mark's a freak. John Mark's in better shape than I am. It's That's scary, wild. isn't it? He, he wrestles. He wrestles hard still. That's I hope scary. I can wrestle as long. <sighs> Don't push. Hey Ian, remember the guy the old man passed us on Mount St. Helens? Yes. And you got he mad, was, and he like said something snarky to us, and you're like, "I'm gonna beat him." Yeah. So then you ran up the mountain and crushed him. Yeah. <laughs> And then had to wait. Like, he had to wait for two hours by himself. <laughs> and then down too. Yeah, down. He wait. crushed me. Well, yeah. you were at the top waiting for me. You beat me about, about what half hour to the top. Yeah. But then, like, you ran down the mountain, so he beat me down the mountain by an hour and a half. Just so you could beat that guy. And the car was locked when I got. <laughs> the it. car was locked, and there's like moose and bears and all types of stuff. Mm-hmm. Real thing. Real thing. I'm. It was, it was a cherished memory. So. Ian, thank you cool. for coming on the Barbarian two hour multiple overtimes. We appreciate it. Jared, yeah. are we good? Thanks, guys. Yeah, thank you. Visit our friend Teague Moore, the wrestling consultant on Facebook or the wrestling Use code BA hour for a free 15 minutes.